Wendy Schmidt is the president of the Schmidt Family Foundation who are sponsoring this event. Wendy, it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Patrick. I don't know what surprised me most this morning. Was it the stand next to my bed that said they could wash my sheets every three days to protect the environment next to a single-use plastic water bottle? Or was it running into Patrick and having him tell me that he went running this morning and then he took a swim in the bay? He said, I'm from Wales. So. I am so delighted to be here with you today on this beautiful morning uh, at one of probably the largest gatherings of its kind um, to bring people together working for a healthy food system in America, Great Britain, and around the world. It's very fitting that this should take place in Northern California. We are in very many ways the heart of the sustainable food movement here. So thank you to Patrick for your thoughtful uh, work in putting this together and all the other organizations that contributed to getting us here to talk about this true cost accounting in our food system. It's exactly what's been missing and we're finally at a place where we can build upon the groundwork of pioneers. Uh, some of you are here today, we'll hear from uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles this morning. I first learned about the intention to hold this, this gathering uh, last summer. I happened to be in England in July, and I happened to have an invitation from Patrick to visit the, the uh, home farm and to have tea with Prince Charles at Highgrove. So I thought, oh, that will be fun. I invited my friend Ellen MacArthur. Uh, she's the famous sailor who set the world record for solo navigation around the world in 2005 in a 72-foot catamaran. And she runs a foundation now that is uh, dedicated to developing the circular economy. So our foundations have been working together for several years. And I thought, let's get us all together with Prince Charles. So there we were in this lovely little drawing room. And the butler had brought in the tea sandwiches and the little cakes. And I had to pinch myself because Prince Charles was sitting with a little tea kettle on a hot plate pouring tea for Patrick and Ellen and me. And it was absolutely this amazing thing. Um, so as we spoke that afternoon, it was really very easy, a very nice conversation, and, and he was such a warm person. And it seemed to Ellen and to me that, that Prince Charles had not only been really prescient more than 40 years ago when he began his crusade against the hyper-industrialization of agriculture, but that he'd also come to feel over the years a little bit from where he stood like a lone voice in the wilderness, calling for change in a world that was largely ignoring or ridiculing what he had to say uh, about something he'd studied quite rigorously since his youth. So we actually found ourselves saying to him, you are not alone. You know, there's this very large tribe of people, uh, so many people around the world now working seriously on those very issues that he identified about a food system that's basically becoming more and more unhealthy, however you look at it. However we got on this path, it's not good for our commons. Either the, the air, the water, the soil, biodiversity and plant life, the welfare of our animals, or for the humans working in food production and service, or consuming a diet rich in industrial food-like substances, poor in real nutrients, particularly those people with the least resources to choose alternatives. So we said, how do we work on this together? So in this meeting, we're going to hear from all sides of these issues, from those on the ground, from those in the halls of government agencies, from small producers and large vendors, like Bon Appetit Management. Thank you so much, Fidel, for, for your generous support of this event. We're going to hear from scientists and journalists and activists, from nonprofits working to develop and support sustainable practices, and from officials struggling to stride into this new world that demands accountability. That new idea that people actually care where their food comes from and who made it and, and, and what its story is. Uh, you may know, for example, that 80% of the seafood that we consume in the United States is imported, mostly from Southeast Asia. But did you know that under current regulations, once those products have cleared through customs in the United States, the requirement to label them disappears? So however those seafood products leave the warehouse, in whatever packages, on whatever pallets, labeled accurately or not, you'll never be able to trace exactly what you're selling or what you're buying and what you're eating. So as you can imagine, this leaves a wide berth for every kind of misrepresentation, some of which is deliberate and actually criminal. 
But we are not where we are in a dangerous food system by malice. Instead, it's been the subtle seduction of simple economics and the economic self-interest of larger and larger consolidated players who dictate what is planted, how animals are raised, how we measure success in feeding the world while wasting nearly half of all the food that we produce. Today's food system is loaded with perverse incentives. And like anything designed to be increasingly efficient and self-referencing above all else, it grows in loop after careless loop until you have developed into a kind of cancer with a cascade of unintended consequences. So we've got a long way to go if we're going to be accountable, although we have lots of new technologies to help us do that. We have a long way to go if we're going to be safe or fair or mindful, or educated. But the people here in this extraordinary gathering are the leaders among those who are going to shape the roadmap to a better new design that takes into account all those factors, those externalities that are not counted in the true cost of food. You know, it's getting hard to ignore this no matter who you are. Just last Friday, I picked up the Wall Street Journal business section, and there was a story on the front page that was titled Cargill's New Place in the Food Chain. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Story went on to describe how the company's 56-year-old uh, CEO, David McLennan, is working to reshape the company after two years of declining profits. The 150-year-old company with 140,000 employees spread across 70 countries is described as moving out of the palatial mansion executive offices it had occupied in suburban Minneapolis for 85 years to more modest digs without the spiral staircases and crackling fireplaces. The reporter wrote that Mr. McLennan was facing the challenge of satisfying customers in Western markets who are shying away from the mainstream food brands that rely on the low-cost, commoditized ingredients that have been the specialty of companies like Cargill. So here's what Cargill's CEO said about this new marketplace. They want to know what's in their food, what kind of company it is, are they ethical, how do they treat animals, he added, that's what North America and Europe and then I think increasingly other economies are going to want. So at last we reach a point where this is not a cyclical problem. It's not a grain market boom or bust. This is something quite different. It's more of a sweeping change that is happening not just in the food sector, but in energy, banking, fashion, professional sports, personal care and cleaning products, and so many more. To me as a sailor, there is a sea change occurring. The little signs and signals that you look for in the skies when you're out on the ocean, the clouds on the edge of an approaching weather system, they signal what's to come. And so I'm actually very hopeful. As we come here together this week, we are making progress in addressing a core issue Prince Charles identified in a speech to a gathering like this one in Washington DC in 2011. This is what he said. It is, I feel, our apparent reluctance to recognize the interrelated nature of the problems and therefore the solutions that lies at the heart of our predicament, and certainly on our ability to determine the future of food. So I say to all of us, and particularly to Prince Charles, we understand those many interconnections. That's what we're doing here this week. And out of our meeting, we want to develop those irrefutable talking points that create the umbrella for us to gather under. Because after all this time and all this work, we need to present one voice, whether our particular issue is articulated explicitly or not. That's the, the task that we have, the, the production of a kind of beginning of a manifesto that we all sign up for. Because that's the only way we're going to act as that big tribe. So I can say to Prince Charles, we've got your back and we're on it. And I'm looking forward to this day very much. Um, let's get to work. Thank you.